for the worship. He's enabled us to worship him in spirit and in truth. Amen. Uh, how many of you are happy to be in the presence of God this morning? Uh, even with everything that's going on around us, uh, it's a joy to be in the presence of God. It's a joy to worship him and know him. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Let's pray. And uh, before uh, we get into meditating the word, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we want to thank you. We want to give you glory, honor, and praise for this time. We give you thanks, Lord God, for enabling us to come into your presence this morning. Oh, Father God, uh, as we meditate on your word, we seek you, Holy Spirit, God, to come and refresh us, speak to us, and teach us what you have. Lord, it is not my voice. It is not my uh, ability to uh, speak what I want to, but I, Lord, I submit myself to your authority and control this morning and ask you, God, that you minister to us, Holy Spirit, and ask you that you would teach us so that we have something to take back this morning. We thank you. We give you glory, honor, and praise. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Uh, the title of my message this morning is Victory from Within. Amen. We have all been created. We have uh, the ability to live victorious lives. Amen. All of us do. And uh, uh, it's not that all the time we are uh, in a position way where we are operating in victory. Not all the time. Amen. And so they, these are inconsistencies that are in us because of which we are not victorious always. Amen. So uh, let's turn to Philippians chapter 4. Philippians chapter 4. Um, I'm going to read from... Uh, I'm going to read from verse uh, 11 to 13. A very famous, um, well-known passage. Most of us know this. Uh, so if everybody is there in Philippians chapter 4, reading from verse 11 to 13. Not that I speak in regard to need, for I have learned in whatever state I am to be content. I know how to be abased. I know how to abound. Everywhere and in all things I have learned both to be full and to be hungry, to, uh, both to abound and to suffer need. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Amen. Let's say that. Declare it on yourself. I can do all things. Through Christ who strengthens me. Once again, I can do all things through, through Christ who strengthens me. Amen. Now, we declare this. We speak about this many a time. We are, uh, we are uh, always in the state of mind that I can do all things. But do you think that you can do all things? But do, do we feel that we can do all things? Amen. That raises a very, this is a very powerful statement. And it raises questions in our mind. That whether we can do all things or not. All things. Not something. But all things. I can do all things through Christ. Now the context of this uh, passage is that uh, Paul is writing, to the, uh, writing about the Philippian generosity. But again he's teaching them something that he can do all things because why? He has learned. He has learned to do all these things. He's not just learned to do tent making, which was his profession or vocation. He was, uh, by vocation, he was a tent maker. He used to stitch tents. He didn't say that he'd learned all things because he went to the school of Gamaliel. He didn't say that he learned all things because he was charged by the Pharisees to go and persecute the Christians. He learned all things. He learned all things in Christ. Amen? Amen? So he is not putting here, uh, putting forth his uh, uh, physical or his mental ability to do things. But what he's saying is that I can do all things be through Christ because I have learned to do those things. Learning is a process which most of us do not want to really go through, undergo, because it's difficult, one. And then it takes us out of our comfort zone. Right? 
It pulls us out of our comfort zone. Not everyone is interested to come out of their comfort zone. If I've been doing such a, uh, anything that's at my workplace in a certain way, I want to stick to that process because to move out and then create a new process and then go do it, 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 it again, it's like reinventing the wheel, right? We don't want to do that. And so we don't want to move out of our comfort zones. But if we don't move out of, out of our comfort zone, victory is not guaranteed. There are many people in the Bible that we know uh, who had a glorious beginning, but the ending was not so great. There were so many people in the Bible who had uh, not so good beginning, but the end was better, much better than the beginning. Amen. So this morning, I want you to really uh, focus on, uh, uh, on really winning from within, victory from within. Our, the name of our church is Daily Victory Church. Amen. And so it's, it's very important that we are victorious. Now, victory does not mean, uh, uh, again, don't uh, mix up victory with material things at all. It is not material. Victory is not material. Victory is first spiritual in your heart. Amen. And then you... The byproduct of this victory is always seen in the material. The byproduct is seen in the, in the material. It doesn't, it's, it's always from within. It's not from outward. We live from the inside and not from the outside. If you are thinking that your materialistic things, the good things that you have in the world, in the flesh, in the material, are your blessings, then you're living from the outside in and not the inside out. The Bible says that the Holy Spirit has been given to us, and the Holy Spirit resides inside of us. Amen? And if the Holy Spirit is residing inside of us, then we, are go we have to live inside out. Inside out. That's why the victory is always from the within. Amen? So... Let's put this in our mind. Victory is always in from the within. I live inside out. And Paul is saying he has learned how to be abased. He has learned how to abound. Uh, everywhere and in all things, I have learned to be both full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. Uh, very ironic statement. Because after that, he says that, you know, uh, I can do all things in Christ who strengthens me. But here he's talking about uh, need. He, he's to, to suffer need and to both to abound, to be hungry. How is that possible? This man is differentiating the flesh from the, from the heavenly, from the, uh, from the earth, heavenly realm. He's able to differentiate that. In the flesh, we will suffer need. Jesus also suffered need. He also used to eat. Uh, he also needed bread, water, just like you and I. Right? That is in the flesh. Right? And, 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 but what is happening is Paul is saying that he has learned how to go through those situations. So basically, he's saying that he, he, he has power over those situations. He has power over those situations. Why? Because he's living from the inside out. He has victory over those situations because he's living, he's having victory from within. Uh, many a times we know that there are certain things that we cannot live without. Water, we cannot live without water. Yes, we fast um, and, and uh, probably we, can not, we, we might not drink water for let's say one day, seven days. There are people who fast 21 days or 40 days, fine. But beyond that, your body requires water. That's how it's been created. Right? But, but here's the thing. If you're going through that fast of one day, seven days, 21 days, you have learned how to do that. We have learned how to do that. Now, one thing that happens uh, after a, 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 a person is born again and uh, receives, we know that we are born again through the Holy Spirit. It's not by any... Uh, uh, we, it's, it's first the love of God which uh, uh, prods us and pushes us and enables us to be born again, to accept Jesus Christ our, as our personal Lord and Savior, right? 
Now, after this happens, it's all good. Uh, we, we start coming to church and uh, we start, uh, the, you know, going, we start part of being part of cell groups and all those things. And everything is going on good. And then we say, hallelujah, praise the Lord. That's good. But again, the victory is not seen. Victory is not seen sometimes. Why is that happening? Is because we are frustrating the grace of God in our lives. You know, humans have this unique ability to frustrate the grace of God. Okay, let me say that. We have this ability to frustrate the grace of God. Why? Is because we have not understood what God's grace is. And I'm not going to go into grace, actually. But I'm going to show some inconsistencies that few people in the Bible had because of which they frustrated the grace of God. And uh, uh, <clears throat> let's not go with this mindset that, that grace did not exist before Jesus. Okay? Uh, grace was there because God's calling is a calling of grace. And he called many people in different ways. So for our first uh, person, we are going to go to Judges chapter 6. Again, this guy is a Bible hero. Judges chapter 6 and uh, reading from verse 36 to 40. Judges chapter 6, reading from verse 36 to 40. Amen. So Gideon said to God, If you will save Israel by my hand, as you have said, look, I shall put a fleece of wool on the threshing floor. If there is dew on the fleece only, and it is dry on all the ground, then I shall know that you, have saved is that you will save Israel by my hand, as you have said. And it was so. When he rose early the next morning and squeezed the fleece together, he wrung the dew out of the fleece, a bowl full of water. Then Gideon said to God, Do not be angry with me, but let me speak just once more. Let me test, I pray, just once more with the fleece. Let it now be dry only on the fleece, but on, but on all the ground let there be dew. And God did so that night, and it was dry on the fleece only. But there was dew all around. Now, very classic example, and uh, we know the mindset of Gideon. When, G when God called Gideon, he, he said, you know what? I am from such a low tribe. I come from this family, that family. All said and done, fine. Then God uh, said, you know what? You just go ahead, and I'm going to give you victory. But this man had so much doubt in his mind. He did not trust God for his victory. He, was, he, he went to the point of testing God and saying that, you know, now show me that, you will, that, uh, that victory will come through me. He wanted some guarantee. The Bible says that we walk by faith and not by sight. You want to live the inside out? Close your eyes. You got to walk by faith. This, this guy had trust issues with God. That means he did not have faith in God. God said, I am going to deliver, but not once, twice. He said, you know what? I'm going to test you this way, and I'm going to test you. And then if I'm comfortable, then I'm going to go. Uh, the, 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 the problem is not with the approach that uh, Gideon had. The problem was in the mindset that he was carrying at that time when he was face to face with uh, the angel of God. Uh, think about this. If, if we were to get such a word, let's say an angel visits you and then he, he says that, you know, what well, this is going to happen, how would you feel? Very happy, right? And, and then you will say, okay, I'm going to go and do it. I mean, at this time when uh, uh, but when these things don't happen, where the angel visits and all those things don't happen, we, we, we hardly get to hear those things in reality. But this man had the angel visiting him, and, and, and this is what he did, because of which he doubted his own victory. Eventually, God had to do that because he released the word, and he chose this man to do it. But Gideon frustrated God and God's grace 
by doubting his own victory because he did not trust the word of God on his face. He did not trust the word of God on his face. So faith or or, our lack of faith and doubting our own victory is one way we can frustrate we can uh, frustrate the, the grace of God. The second thing that we do, <clears throat> and this is so common today these days, is uh, we want uh, affirmation, confirmation, validation from the society. Everything that goes on um, Instagram, Facebook, and everything, I mean, there are people who live their lives on Instagram and uh, Facebook or I'm not saying it's not bad. There are so many filters that go out there before something comes in and you see that. Validation. Approval. If I do something like this, uh, then I will be considered, you know, a better person or whatever. Many Christians are also going down that path. We want validation and approval, and we think we get it from the world if I do something like that. Uh, uh, There's this new term that has come up called influencers. We find that a lot on Instagram and on uh, LinkedIn. Very good. Influencing is very good. In fact, that is one of the ways to live a victorious life from within. Amen? But, but for some people who want to influence uh, the world... Their entire world is around these things that they post. If I do not post like this, then what is going to happen is the world is not going to accept me. If I do not put this picture, if I do not put this video out every day, 6.30 a.m. in the morning, the world will not accept me. So you are putting yourself under pressure because you want approval from the world. So what does that mean? We are living according to the standards of the world, not the standards of God. The Bible says in Romans chapter 12 and verse 2, Be ye transformed by what? The renewing of your mind. Do not be conformed, what? To the world. And transformation starts here. Amen? The heart is not where the transformation starts. Because the heart is the throne seat of God. And the heart is easy to convince. But the mind is what demands logic. The mind says, you know what? This does not seem right. Right? How can that be possible? How can that happen? It wants an explanation. And so we go down that path And then what do we do? We are looking for authentication. We are looking for validation from the society, from the world. Psalm chapter 51, verse 6 says, You desire truth in the inward parts. Inward parts. Oh, wow. You desire truth in the inward parts. Meaning, my whole being from the inward has to be truthful, not what I am from the outside. It is very easy to fool people or it is very easy to fool yourself by pretending what you are by putting on those filters. But you know what you are and your God knows what you are. And if you are a child of God, you have to be truthful from the inside out, meaning your inward parts have to be truthful. And, and we are so scared to do that. It is very difficult to do that. I cannot, when I meet someone for the first time, I will present myself to be a very amicable, very good person. I will present myself to be, you know, very cultured and um, um, know everything and a good, a good person. I'm not saying that's not good to do. It's good to do that. Amen? But as a child of God, as a Christian, be truthful. Show what you are. When I go in front of God and I present myself uh, or when I present myself to the world in the way that I'm presenting, I am acknowledging that I'm broken. I am acknowledging that I, uh, that I need God's help to uh, change me. I am acknowledging. And if that acknowledgement, if that sense of acknowledgement is there, is not there in us, then I don't know what we are trying to do. 
we are not seeking God in spirit and truth. We are not, uh, uh, we are not walking according to the desire of God to be truthful from the inside. This is the second way that we frustrate God's grace in our lives. And uh, I will say this, it is okay to accept that there are inconsistencies in our life, there are shortcomings in our lives. It is okay. Why? Because you have the grace of God to cover it. And then He will put you through a process of change. Because the goal is that we are not here to, um, uh, of course, the, the uh, larger plan is to um, take the gospel. We, we've got to tell people about the gospel and everything. But, but look what Jesus said. One verse that comes to my mind from Matthew is that, uh, let men might see the good works and glorify God in heaven. The good works. Now, good works come if, 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 if it comes from the inside. Good works do not, I mean, I can show forth good works, but if they have to glorify your God in heaven, then it has to be different. It shouldn't come with filters. And it's a very difficult thing to let go. Very difficult to let go and take out those filters and show forth what you are. Amen? Uh, and, and this is what I will tell all the young people. Because we are so much into technology, we want to... It's, it's all good to do Instagram. It's all good to do Facebook. Everything is fine. But like Paul says, not everything that is good is good for me. Amen? We've got to differentiate. We've got to discern. Amen. Hallelujah. The third person that I want to talk about is uh, King Saul, a very classic example. He frustrated God's grace in his life by showing insecurities. He was completely an insecure guy. And, and, and he went so crazy. I mean, we can read about him from 1 Samuel chapter 9 to chapter 38. Go home and study about him. It's a great study. Started off very well. But, uh, I mean, he was a, he was a very, uh, I mean, God chose him. The Bible says that uh, he was, uh, what? He was uh, taller than the others in the whole of Israel. Physical ability, physical features were good. But God did not choose him for that. But God chose him. But from that moment, from there... He became a fearful, manipulative, vengeful, murderous person by the end of his time. The end was not good. In the end, he had to tell his charioteer to what? To, to kill him. Kill him. The end was not good. Why? Because he went down that path where he allowed... The Bible says that, you know, when he was... Uh, um, Going back home after Samuel <clears throat> anointed and prophesied on him, he was in the group of the prophets and he started prophesying, wow. What does that tell me? What, did that, what does that tell me? I can, I, can, uh, uh, I, am, I can be, after I become a believer, after I am filled with the Holy Spirit, I will prophesy and I can be in a community of people or in the group of people, and I can also prophesy, but look what happened. If we are not enabling and sustaining the grace of God through the Holy Spirit in our lives, this man did not carry on prophesying. Eventually, he went and visited what? The sorcerers, the witches, consulted them instead of consulting God. So what does that tell me? It's not necessary that the Holy Spirit of God is permanently dwelling in us. We can frustrate Him and He can go out. It's possible. There are many like this. Um, I was, uh, uh, the, the, with the young adults, we are doing this book of Acts. And uh, 
not yesterday, but the, but last week we were studying about uh, um, the conversion of Simon the sorcerer from Acts chapter 8. The motive for his conversion, for him to accept Jesus Christ, was different. And in the same chapter, we have the story of the uh, Ethiopian, right? The, the high official from the court of the queen of Ethiopia. He was coming to visit Jerusalem. He, he did his offerings and everything. And then when he was going back, he was reading the book of Isaiah. And he was reading exactly the point where Isaiah is prophesying about Jesus. And then the Spirit of God carries Philip to go and teach him what that, what that reading means. The difference between these two people was that, you know, the motive of Simon the sorcerer was to gain power. The, he saw Peter and John doing the miracles. People were getting healed. Lives were being changed. Many things happening which uh, were not happening even though he was practicing sorcery. So he goes to Peter after being baptized. He goes to Peter and says, you know, I'm going to give you money. And give me that power. King Saul went down that path. King Saul went down that path. What motivated him to rule the country was not to serve his people. It was fear which motivated him to rule. It was vengeance. We see how he pursued David to kill him. So, the cause of all this is what? Insecurity. And, and uh, we give that space to Satan to come and, uh, you know, take care of that. And, and occupy that, basically. The situation that he was in, instead of seeking God, he sought something else. He allowed something else to come in. And Mr. Satan is an un uninvited guest everywhere. Amen. So, so look how Gideon, how King Saul frustrated the grace of God by doing what they did. And how in these days we frustrate the grace of God by, uh, by, by seeking validation, authentication, and approval from the society. Amen. Now, coming back to Philipp Philippians chapter 4, verse 11 and 13. Uh, Sorry, verse 11 to 13. How could, uh, how could Paul do this? How could he emphatically say that uh, I can do all things? Now, if we want to do something, we can daydream. I tell this always. We can dream dreams and say that, you know, I want that. But daydreams cost us nothing. All you have to do is just lie down on your bed. And you can dream throughout the day, throughout the night. Nothing, no action required. But for you to make, turn your dreams into reality, what you got to do, you got to take some action. So it means that you step out of your comfort zone and do something. Because God has deposited something inside of you which is unique. All right? And then it is for you whether you want to allow it to manifest or not. The Holy Spirit has been given to all of us. But why is it that all the nine gifts of the Holy Spirit do not manifest in us? We've got to allow it to. The Bible says that one of the manifestations of the Holy Spirit is to speak in tongues. And this is what I will say. It comes from the inside, not from the outside. I don't look at someone. No one has to give you a teaching. No one has to, not teaching, but no one has to tell you to speak in a certain way. And I, unfortunately, I've seen this happen. No one has to. Because it comes from the inside if you enable him to do what he has to do. You've got to be submissive. Amen? So, so... So the thing is, we have this unique ability. We have this unique power in us.
do we want to allow him to manifest? If we want to allow him to manifest, you move out of your comfort zone. Then the second thing is God is not selective about grace. He's not selective. He didn't say, you know what, I have, uh, I have uh, you know, I'll give more to Pastor Gilles. Or I will give more to uh, Deacon Vincent here. No, he's not selective about it. He's just, it's, it's for all. It's the same. He doesn't play favorites. Now, here's the thing. When he gives grace, we have to de uh, develop the ability to pay the price for that grace to manifest. You should be willing to pay the price. And paying the price means that you have to give up and go ahead. Give up and go ahead. And if you are not willing to do the giving up and we are not willing to do the going ahead, then you are stationary. You are just there. Exactly the same spot. And many Christians are in their, in their faith walk. They are still in the same spot. One of, the, uh, uh, one of the goals of this ministry, Heaven Citizenship Ministries, is to walk in daily victory. Walk. You can't be stationary. One of the goals here is that we want to be able to enable people through the teaching to walk in daily victory. And it requires you to move. Be on the move. Because our God is always on the move. Trust me, when I try to understand this God on the move, it, what the way I understand it, he, Jesus said that he is, it is finished. He has given everything that we, he had to give us. It's over. And we, instead of claiming that word and moving forward, we are still somewhere in, what, 2019 trying to ask God for, he has already given that. You and he's already moved on because he's already planned what he has to give you in the year 2022 maybe or 2023. He's already planned that. And we are still somewhere behind trying to ask God, oh God, I want that. Amen. The other thing that we've got to be doing here is uh, if you think you are here to live the victorious life from within, you got to be ready for the long haul. Amen? Imagine you are going from coast to coast, from the east to the west coast. What do you do? You plan. Two, you, you ensure that you have a good vehicle because the, the drive from coast to coast is, uh, is, is, is a long drive. You want to make sure that your tires are working. You've got the best tires. The most important thing you do is you want to see where you can uh, refuel yourself from time to time. And every time you refuel, what do you do? Your tank is full. Right? You want to do that. Every time you refuel, your tank is full. If anyone has planned that, that's what they will do. Right? Now, our tanks have to be full when we, when we, when we are planning to do this. When we want to walk in victory, our tanks should be full. What should we be full of? Full of the Holy Spirit of God. Full of the Holy Spirit of God. That means everything that the Bible says about you that you will manifest, it should manifest in our lives. If you are here for the long haul, that's what you got to do. But if you are here just for the short term, no, there are no shortcuts. There are no shortcuts. You can plan. You can have a strategy on how the Holy Spirit, God, is telling you to walk the faith walk of life, but there are no shortcuts. It requires a change of process. Now look what Paul has done. Two very important things he talks about in uh, Philippians chapter 4 is, one, uh, he's talking about discipline. And uh, two, he's talking about dominion. Three, he's talking about how he has achieved this through the power of Christ. Amen? Discipline. Now, 
uh, this is how I want you to look at discipline. What is God's investment in you? Salvation and grace. Amen? And what is your investment in yourself? Spiritual discipline. If there is no investment, there is no return on investment. You, I mean, uh, you can, you can, you can read as many books as possible. You can see as many YouTube videos uh, as much as possible. For you to have a return on investment, you have to invest. People invest money. People invest their, uh, um, uh, what should I say, their skill. People invest their know-how. That is an investment. If you're not investing, if you're not putting the seed... You cannot harvest. Very simple. I mean, the world calls this calls it uh, investment. I will call it seed and uh, harvest. No seed, no fruit. If you're not willing to go through that process, because Paul went through that process, the first thing he did was he started practicing. He learned. He says, one Timothy chapter four and eight says. Physical training is of some value, but godliness, that is spiritual training, is of value in everything and in every way, since it holds promise for the present life and for the life to come. Uh, let's talk about athletes. My very, the, it's a very nice way to tell, uh, give an example of physical and spiritual training. Um, growing up, um, I was a fan of uh, athletes like um, Ben Johnson, Carl Lewis. And today, Usain Bolt, the fastest men on earth. Like, they've broken records, right? In their entire career, in their entire career, the amount of time that they might have spent in their entire career to compete on the track and field might not be more than 20 minutes. <laughs> Maybe, I mean, if I talk about Usain Bolt, although he's retired but now the fastest man, he might not have spent 20 minutes or maybe less on the track and field competing, competing at, at uh, whatever international event, whatever it is. But what happens is when he does that, he turns out to be the fastest man. Fastest. How is he able to do that? Because he spends hours and hours and hours in practice. practice. You've got to do that. And for practicing, that is his single focus. I want to be the world's number one track and field athlete. 400 meters, 4 into 100 meters, 100 meters dash, whatever it is, I got to be the number one. How will I do that if, if, if you know, he has not been practicing? He cannot put it out there. He will not be even qualifying to be there. For everything that we do, we God says that you know there is a reward. If you want the reward, you've got to practice. If you practice, then only you are victorious from within. And Paul is a very good example. We know his history from what he was to what he became. He says he learned how to do that. He learned how to do that. These people... Uh, the athletes, they, they might not have put in more than 20, 20 minutes is also an exaggeration. The records that he broke is all because of the amount of practice that he put in. If you're not building a particular muscle to do something, then it's, it's not going to enable you to lift that weight or produce that power. Right? You go to the gym and you want to say that, you know what, I want to become slim. You know, I want to build uh, my uh, biceps or triceps. What do you do? You go and actually practice in the gym to build that muscle. You don't sit at home and eat and say, you know, I'm just going to go for a walk and come and it's going to build my muscle. No, it's not going to happen. It's not going to happen. So one of the things that uh, Paul practiced here, is, I mean, he did here was to practice. One of the important aspects of spiritual discipline is to practice it. 
consistently and constantly. I can be on and off. Um, I was uh, looking at the, um, I was looking at a video clip of um, uh, Maradona. I hope you all know him. He was one of the famous Argentine uh, soccer player. Uh, one of the key guys to get home the soccer World Cup for Argentina in 83. Very nice player. Absolutely amazing player. Um, just 5'4 or maybe 5'2, that's his height. But the number of goals that he has scored for Argentina, amazing. And so I was looking at one of his videos just before, I mean, he passed away, uh, I think, the early this year or, uh, or last year towards the end. And when I saw him, I was like surprised. I mean, he was so good when he was during his time as a soccer player. And when he passed away, he passed away because of weight issues and he passed away because of uh, heart problems. Amen. These are good examples for us to look at and how we can rectify ourselves. The end has to be better than the beginning. Not like King Saul. The second thing that he did was uh, perseverance. I want to give a nice example of perseverance here. Let's go to Luke chapter 4. This is like an, maybe you will not agree with me, but I found this very interesting. Luke chapter 4 and verse 13. Luke chapter 4 and verse 13. It says, now when the devil had ended every temptation, he departed from him until an opportune time. <laughs> when the devil had what? What did he do? When the devil had ended every temptation, that means he persevered to tempt Jesus in all the ways possible. That's when he gave up and he said, you know what? I'm still not going to leave. I'm going to come back for an opportune time to tempt Jesus once again. Perseverance is more than endurance. Right? Right? Now, this, <laughs> Satan is enduring here with Jesus from whatever he spoke and said, but he was perseverant to, to tempt Jesus and get what he wanted out of, uh, I mean, get what he had in his agenda. If he could be so persistent, we have the power in us is much more than what is available. He's got fake power. He's got fake power. We have the original, the Holy Spirit. We have the Holy Spirit. How much more persistent should we be? Perseverance is more than just hanging on there. No, 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 don't hang on there. Don't hang on there. You got to stand your ground. Perseverance cannot be that you are just hanging on there by the branch and saying that, you know, God, rescue me. No, it does not happen like that. Because he has given the ability for you to be victorious inside out. If you are not exercising that power to be victorious inside out, you are depending on something else. You are not depending on the Holy Spirit of God to be able to take that step of faith and go out and bring your victory into reality. Not claim your victory. Bring your victory into reality. You have the power to do it. You have the ability to do it. No one can do it for you. Jesus has already done it for you. It is finished in the name of Jesus. So don't say that I'm persevering. Don't say that, you know, it is endurance. No, it is a culmination of all these things. Get in, get your victory, and move ahead. Don't be stationary. Amen? 1 Peter 5, 9 encourages us to be, to first what? Resist the devil and be steadfast in faith. Resist the devil and be steadfast in faith. What, what Satan does at these times is that he will try to play with your mind. Perseverance is also resistance. There are many things. 
I mean, look at Paul. He had many situations to tackle, but he was victorious in all. He said, I can do everything. I can do all things in, through Christ Jesus. That means to say he learned one thing, moved forward. He did not, he did just, just did not forget that. He learned, moved forward, went to another challenge, learned how to overcome the challenge, move forward. And then he was also passing that on to the church. He was teaching them how to do it. We have that same ability. It's just that we don't want to tune our minds. We do not want to go take that route but because it, it is a very difficult path to go. You will stagnate. And we know how stagnation is. The best example that comes to my mind of stagnation is way back home. When rain falls, there's no outlet and water stagnates and it breeds what? Mosquitoes. Mosquitoes bring diseases. It breeds all the dirt. I mean, you guys might have not seen this here. But that's what it is. The third thing that uh, uh, Paul learned was to have an intimate relationship with Jesus. Let's turn to John chapter 15. John chapter 15. And <clears throat> verse 4 to 10. John chapter 15, verse 4 to 10. I'm going to read that verses, these verses for you. It says, Abide in me, and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself, unless it ab abides in the vine, neither can you, unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me, and I in him, bears much fruit. For without me you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he is cast out as a branch, and is withered, and they... Uh, gather them and throw them into the fire, and they are burnt. If you abide in me and my words in you, you will ask what you desire, and it shall be done for you. By this, my Father is glorified that you bear much fruit, so you will be my disciples. As the Father loved me, I also have loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in His love. Intimacy with Jesus. Intimacy is abiding with Him. Uh, when, I, when we think about intimacy with Jesus, it's a relationship. No relationship will uh, stand on things like... Um, uh, you know, I'm going to do this probably once in a week. I'm going to talk to my wife once in a week. Or maybe I will say I will talk to my, or I'll spend time with my kid probably three days or two days in a week. That's it. What happens is relationship does not develop like that. The same with Jesus too. If you are not intimate in your relationship with Jesus, that means to say, I, I, I told this again previously too, and I'm telling this again. The conscious, the unconscious, the subconscious. All these times, all these situations, you have to be directed by the Holy Spirit. The conscious is this state. Right? The unconscious is when we are in deep sleep. The subconscious is when we are here and there. We are not particularly focusing on something. We are subconscious about certain things. But in all these things, you train up your mind, just like Paul, to do what? To keep focused on Jesus, to learn from Him, to hear from Him, and you develop that intimacy with God. Intimacy does not get developed just because you are spending time with God every day in the morning, getting up, uh, reading that, that, that particular passage that from, from that, um, what is that? It could be any book, any writer writes it and you read that passage and you thank God and you pray and that's it done. Then That does not mean intimacy. Intimacy does not get built, developed like that. Intimacy is actually your heart-to-heart -heart talk with Jesus. Your quiet time with Jesus. This is one question I have always in my mind. Am I doing, am I, it's not a fear, but it's a question. Am I 
able to give that time enough for me to be intimate with Jesus, to call that relationship as intimate? Am I able to do that? Let's think about that. If not, we cannot live victorious lives from within. Always it is from within. The second uh, key that Paul is talking about in Philippians 4, uh, um, what is that, 11, is uh, he's talking about dominion. Amen? Let's actually go there. He's talking about dominion. He says, I know I have learned everywhere in all things, everywhere. He's talking about dominion. That means he's having power over his situations. He's having power over his situations. Luke chapter 10, verse 19, Jesus is telling that I have given you all, not limited or some, all power and authority, what, to trample snakes and scorpions and to overcome all the power of the enemy. Nothing, nothing by any means will harm you. He did not say something can harm you, but he said nothing can harm you by any means. Why? Because you have all power. You have all authority. Self-sustaining, dependable. You can use it anytime you want. And still, we want to, you know, we lack that ability to use that power and authority. And that is why the body of Christ today, many people are living defeated lives. Paul understood, learned how to overcome the situation. He did not succumb to the situation. He was not bogged down by the pressures of life around him. Yes, every one of us has challenges. Everyone has some. It's all unique to everyone. We are having those things. But it is the ability to learn and rise up and be seated in the high places with Jesus Christ. You don't want your seat there. You have already thrown in the towel. You've already given up. You, are, you, and you cannot live that victorious life inside out. The third thing that he's talking about is power through Christ. I can do all things through, through Christ who strengthens me. What has God, Jesus, given us? He has made us an overcomer by the very fact that he is resurrected. He's not in the tomb, but he's right next to you. You can claim this power every time, 24-7. 24-7, you can claim this power and walk in power and authority. What does Jesus do? He, didn't, he, he brought us to a point where we have no condemnation over us now. No condemnation, no guilt. So live guilt-free does not mean that it gives you a license to sin again. Because you are under grace. Right? But one of the characteristics of God is justice. It is going to be there. So there is no condemnation for us. He, his death bought reconciliation with the Father. Amen? We, we can now stand guilt-free in front of God. Satan can accuse us. But you are covered with the blood of Jesus. The moment God looks at you in that way, he's like, oh, he's covered. Just pass on. Next. I don't want to talk about it and waste my time. There's no condemnation for us. There's reconciliation now with God. The next thing is, the death of Jesus brought us a future and a hope. So all these are things which are power and authority given to you to live the victorious from the inside out. I want you to look at those areas of defeat which you think were defeats for you. I want you to analyze that. Go back home, take time, and analyze that and see why were you defeated in those areas. Even after being a child of God, even after being, uh, even after being filled with, your, uh, with the Holy Spirit, why were you defeated? What brought you to a point of that defeat? Amen? I want you to take time, reflect, and, uh, and pray about it. 
you need help, the pastors are here. Reach out to any one of the pastors here. We'd be willing to pray for you. Why? Because you cannot live stationary. If you're living stationary, you're stagnating. Stagnation. And stagnation is a disease. Stagnation brings death. You are not the victory that you are supposed to be. Amen. Just like how Paul says, you have to learn how to do all things. You have to learn, train up your mind, go out of your comfort zone and do all things in Christ. Amen. I want all of us to stand up and uh, let's confess this prophetic word once again on our lives. Let's confess this prophetic word once again on our lives. Amen. And say it like you mean it. Say like you have it. Say like you are walking in daily victory. Amen. Let's say this. Let's put your, put, put your hand over your head. And let's say this. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Amen. 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 Hallelujah. 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 Let's pray. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord God, I thank you, Lord God, for this time, for this opportunity once again. We thank you for this word, Lord God, that we will live victorious lives from within, from the inside out. We thank you for this word today. Lord, I pray that everyone who has listened to this word in this room and also, Lord God, on YouTube and live stream, Lord God, wherever they are, bless them, Lord God. Let this word be an anointing for them in this uh, this week, Lord God, we pray, Lord Jesus, as, as they hear this word, Lord God, bring about the change. Take us through that process of change that we have to go through, Lord God, so that we are victorious from the within, from the inside. We thank you, Lord God, once again for this time. In the most precious name of Jesus Christ, my Lord and Savior, I ask and pray. Amen, amen, and amen. Hallelujah.